All right. So each week, uh, as you know, we invite a co-host or co-host to take part in the conversation uh, so that we can leverage their experience, expertise, and their unique perspectives. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome tonight's co-host, uh, Ben Duncombe. Ben is a director and Salesforce recruitment specialist at Talent Hub Global. He's been in the recruiting space for over 14 years, is the host of a popular of the popular Talent Hub Talk podcast, and is a certified Salesforce administrator. It is fantastic to have you co-hosting office hours with me, Ben. Welcome. Thank you very much. 14 years, that makes me sound even older than I am now. <laughs> no worries. Um, do you want to take a moment to further introduce yourself and kind of share your Salesforce story? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Thanks for uh, for everyone attending as well. I'm really honored to be here. Um, so yeah, I'm a Salesforce recruiter. i um, been recruiting for a long time now, as, uh, as we just heard. Um, so I, I've been recruiting in the Salesforce ecosystem for coming up to six years now. Um, I, I started Talent Hub uh, global five years ago, and we are based in Sydney, Australia. Um, so we we recruit roles across the Salesforce ecosystem um, from admin through to technical architect and everything in between. Um, and I think it was 2015, I, I decided that I wanted to pursue the, the Salesforce admin certification myself. Um, so I, I figured I, I don't ever expect I will be a Salesforce professional, um, but I, I thought that it would add more value to my clients and candidates if I knew what I was actually talking about. Um, so went on that journey, I failed the first uh, attempt of certification, and then I went to the, the um, Salesforce bootcamp and uh, passed on the first day of bootcamp and then attempted the app builder on the fifth day and failed that and then failed that again and failed that again and failed that again and I could go on forever. It's, uh, it's been a long journey with App Builder. Um, but what I realized was that I, I didn't have enough actual hands-on Salesforce experience to, to get through that, that certification. Um, so that's been something I've been investing time in. Um, I, I use Salesforce day-to-day -day as a user, um, but I've started doing more hands-on um, configuration of the platform. I actually have a deployment to do um, after this call um, which uh, which is is great. I've had the support of of some people from the community helping me develop my org. Um, see, I like to think of myself as an aspiring trailblazer now, and uh, really passionate about helping people on their journey and uh, and seeing people succeed in the ecosystem. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing your story and, and your your struggles with App Builder and, and the fact that you've uh, you've persevered and you're continuing to configure on the platform. That's awesome. Uh, and and thanks thanks as well for being here. Um, so for those, for those of you who are joining for the first time, um, what I'd like to do is just briefly explain the purpose of these office hours before we open the floor for questions and discussion. Um, as most of you are aware, these sessions are an informal get together for gathering with military trailblazers and allies to explore non-technical Salesforce career and branding related topics, essentially in order to help you achieve your professional development and career related goals. So for the next hour, this is an opportunity for collaborative mentorship where everyone on the call is encouraged to participate in the conversation and help answer questions uh, from your perspective, which will provide, of course, additional diversity of experience to the answers given. As always, keep an eye on the chat window during tonight's session. Um, I and others on the call will typically post a lot of great information in there, including you know, le learning, networking, and employment opportunity um, information. So as you might have guessed, the focus for tonight's session is hiring process, trends, tips, and guidance. Um, I've seen a lot of feedback in the, um, in the, in the um, survey that I sent out indicated that you would really like some help with you know, interview process, recruiting process. And so this is the session for you. Uh, if you want to ask a question at any point, um, go ahead and do so. If you don't feel comfortable speaking up, you can post your questions in chat. You can raise your hand. And then additionally, um, in the future, if you want to post questions, we have a new Military Trailblazer Office Hours group on LinkedIn. So you can post them in there and I can ask them for you. Um, so with that in mind, I will open the floor and turn it back over to you. Who would like to ask the first question? Right. And because I am always prepared, I will go ahead and kick us off while you guys are thinking about it. Uh, so just to kind of um, then give everyone context for, for where we are, you know, uh, obviously there's been a lot of changes over the past year and a half or so. Could you summarize current hiring trends within the Salesforce ecosystem with respect to maybe some of the roles that are hot, um, hard to fill and, and folks are looking for, as opposed to those that are the opposite and, and really are not hard to fill and maybe declining in demand? 
Yeah, it's a good question. And obviously, a lot of my insight comes from the Australian market. So um, I'll just kind of lead with that. But I um, yeah. I had Christopher Hopper, who's a US-based recruiter on our podcast recently. And uh, he's a great guy to follow as well for anyone that, that, that isn't. Um, so I've got some context from the US market as well based on that discussion. And it seems to me that every, um, every market um, at the moment from a Salesforce perspective is, is candidate short, um, experience short and quality short. So there's um, yeah a huge amount of demand in the market for for people with um, with a range of Salesforce skills. So I, I, I don't like to think of any um, skill set as as necessarily um, declining or, or the demand is declining. I think maybe just changing a little bit. Um, so I think that there's been a lot of talk recently with some posts online around potentially the admin role um, you know declining or not being in as much demand as. As it is, and I wouldn't say that's the case because I think there's always going to be demand for admins, right? Someone needs to support the users, look after the platform, and and be the face of the platform to the business. I just think that role maybe is changing a little bit in that obviously flows are, are becoming um, more of a thing and and becoming more and more important. Um, so I think people need to to be aware of what the trends are and and focus on what's coming down the line in the next six to 12 months compared to what I used to be good at or what I used to focus on. Um, I, I spoke to an admin or an aspiring admin recently and I asked what their differentiator is gonna be. And um, and she said that she wants to focus on reports and dashboards. And um, and I said, you know, that's great, but that isn't gonna be much of a differentiator. Like there, there is at the moment um, an opportunity to level the playing field by getting really good at flows because there'll be admins that have 10 years experience that are really good with workflows and some um, process builder, but they might not be experts on flows yet. Um, so you're never going to be as good as them or, or as knowledgeable as them with workflows because they've been doing it for 10 years. But you can become as good as them at flows because they're still learning at the moment. So, so yeah, I think that, that that's not a, a skill set that's declining, but it's just changing and you need to kind of keep up with the times and the technology. Um, the developer role for me is the one that's really expanding, and um, and and you know every single day I'm I'm being approached by by companies looking for developers. Um, I'm looking for for you know developers at all levels really. So people that that have some fundamental development skills that want to come into Salesforce, we can find opportunities for people like that. Um, and then obviously the the really experienced people that have been coding for for, for many years and, and have lots and lots of Salesforce experience um, as well as other technologies as well. So so I would say that's the hottest um, area for me uh, right now is the um, is the development skill set. Um, and then you've got some uh, Adam on the call is is a, a DevOps specialist. We're seeing more and more demand in that space. Um, that's a growing area um, as well. So I, I'm, a, I'm encouraging developers to, to think more broadly about, um, you know, what, what are the niche areas around development and, and areas that I could become an expert in rather than just going after the, you know, the lightning web components that everyone's talking about right now, because everyone's doing that. Everyone's trying to upskill in lightning web components. But um, for, for some reason, um, the DevOps crew seem to be a strange bunch because no one wants to do it. <laughs> Where, but there's a lot of demand there, right? So if you can position yourself as a DevOps specialist, then then you're going against the crowd that are chasing the Lightning Web Component stuff, and, and maybe there's a niche there for you. Um, so yeah, may, maybe just think about the the areas that aren't as fashionable and uh, trendy right now, and because they're jobs that still need to be done, and uh, you can carve out a niche there. No, those are great points, and what I took away is is your mention of a, of a way to differentiate yourself, but also um, to keep pace with the platform. So you know, as you talked about. You know, workflows and process builder at some point are going to go away. And I think everyone, you know, the writing's on the wall. It's all going to be going to flows. And so if you're able to learn flows and use that as a differentiator, that's great. Um, and to your point, you know, I think the, my personal opinion, the closer you can get to being a developer, the better. So even if, if you, you know, you don't want to be a, a uh, you know, if, if you don't want to specialize in development, learning flows and being able to to kind of bridge the gap between straight configuration and 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 the programmatic side is a great skill to have and that, that was one of the reasons why i took it up um so you know, it looks like uh, we've got quite a few hands raised now since we've we've um kicked off the conversation so we'll go ahead and and turn it over to amber to get started amber you had a question and if you're talking amber you might be on mute Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, I got you now. Yes. Oh, got it. Sorry. I don't know. Speakers. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, Ben. I'm Amber out of Florida. Hey, I've, I've nice got to a different. Me. You too. I've got a different question. As I make my pivot and I'm gaining my first Salesforce uh, administrative certification, 
the actually Salesforce role that I'm looking at is customer or employee success. So as I'm new, as I'm new to the industry um, and doing those informational interviews, um, how do I best leverage right my past experience um, through HR and, and veteran uh, resource transition things like that? How do I best highlight that to a recruiter? Um, you know, like I said, as I gain more Salesforce knowledge and whatnot, what are some of your thoughts or tips that can kind of set me apart? Yeah, I think the the um, the biggest challenge with finding your first role is that a lot of people think that. Um, the best way to do that is through a recruiter. And in my experience, being a recruiter, unfortunately, it's not like I, I, um, in, I think the, the, the up-to-date numbers over the last six years, I've placed like 255 Salesforce professionals in the last five and a bit years. And um, I would say three to four of those have been people that have come into the ecosystem that, that I've helped get their first role. Um, and I wish that wasn't the case. I wish there were a lot more. Um, but the, the reality is that a lot of the time people aren't coming to me for people to, that are transitioning their careers. Um, so I think the, the best way for you to position your experience is with people that actually have the need. Um, so, you know, who are the people that are running these customer success teams in companies? Um, because they're the ones that actually are really going to value all of that work that you've done before. Whereas a lot of recruiters um, and, uh, and you know, it's not, not necessarily the right thing, but unfortunately they're looking for for tick boxes and and buzzwords on a CV and and they can't see through that sometimes because they've got a target to hit and they're looking for the best person to take that role at the quickest time frame possible. So um, sometimes, unfortunately, they're they're not going to play the long game and help that that you get to that next level. But and that's really frustrating. It frustrates me and and I try to give as much time to people as I can to help on that journey. But um, that's not the the kind of service you'll get from everyone, unfortunately. So um, so my advice would be to to be going directly to all of the people that you want to work for, um, and and positioning that right. So you're you're going out of your way to get the Salesforce certification so that you are a better customer success or um, uh, employee in that space because you have that platform knowledge. Um, so I'd be talking about that, you know, pr- uh, promoting that, but in in line with how how you think that that previous experience can actually benefit or how you would approach the new role based on the experience you have. Um, because, yeah, I, I think you have a wealth of experience that, that people are looking for, um, but sometimes it's not going to get to the people that have the need because because it's get, there, there's a bottleneck and that's the recruiter that that is, isn't prepared to play that long game, unfortunately. Perfect. Thank you so much. No, I appreciate it. Those are a lot of uh, helpful tips and hints, so I definitely appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Annie, you've got your hand raised. Did you want to pose a question? I'm curious on what your thoughts are on what we're seeing, I see at least on social media, the disconnect between um, job roles and experience versus like um, the expectations on that side. Is Do you think the disconnect is coming from the corporate side or is it coming from the employee side? Looking at an, an entry-level positions um, I was seeing you needed five to 10 years of experience. Well, it's an entry level position. How can I have an entry level position with five to 10 years experience if I can't get the position to get the experience? Um, is it that the market is just flooded in some areas and that's why that expectation is there or is there just a complete disconnect somewhere? Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. So in, in 14 years of recruitment experience, I've probably never placed um, anyone into a role that's ticked every single box on a job description. Um, like I think they're, they're often wish lists and, um, and, and a lot of people don't apply for roles that they don't think they meet all of the requirements for. And my advice is if you don't meet all of the requirements, but you meet some of them, well, I would say most of the requirements, not like, you know, I, I wouldn't say applying for a technical architect role just because you have a Salesforce admin, so it's the right thing to do. But if you tick, you know, 75, 80% of those requirements, then, then I would be applying because it's really, really rare for companies to find someone that ticks every box. Um, and then the other thing um, to bear in mind is a lot of the time, the people that are writing the job descriptions aren't the people that actually understand Salesforce. So they could be written by someone from HR. Um, a lot of the time I get calls from companies that are about to start writing a job description and they ask me for other job descriptions that they can copy, um, which is crazy, right? Because you're writing a job description on your requirements and you're copying and pasting from another business. Um, so I, I think when people are looking for um, junior um, entry level roles and advertising for five years, they probably aren't the right company for you anyway. You probably don't want to work for a company like that. Um, you, you want to be looking for the companies that are looking to give people a chance and, and are being fair and reasonable with their job descriptions. Um, and I appreciate that can be a bit of a, um, 
a, a treasure hunt because they don't always um, exist. But um, but yeah, I wouldn't let job descriptions put you off. I, I think um, you know l- look for the roles that you feel you're confident you could deliver, and, and don't worry too much about the long list of um, of wish lists that, that people write. And um, and yeah, again, I, I think it comes back to um, building connections with the hiring managers and connecting with companies directly. Uh, people find it strange when I say this, but try try as best you can when you're looking for your first role in Salesforce to cut out the recruiter, um, cut cut me out of the process and go direct because you've then you you know people are looking at you as an individual rather than you as a CV. And if you can build that relationship and and you know present yourself in a way um, that 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 you know rings true with the hiring manager. Then, uh, then you're more likely to to get an opportunity to to speak with them and an interview if you don't tick all of the boxes, like I said. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, I see Torin. I see your comment in there. We'll go ahead and, and uh, grab Dennis's question, and then we'll circle back to you. So, Dennis, if you want to pose your question. Hi, Ben. Thanks for coming on. Hey, um, I'm just curious. How does the uh, Salesforce job market in general compare with Australia? Um, same, same, or any differences in skill set demands or other trends? And then number two, how hard would it be for a U.S. citizen to just move down to Australia and find a job? Sales, you know, American citizen, Salesforce certified. Uh, how hard is that? Um, so on your first point, is that question like Salesforce compared to other technologies within Australia? No, Salesforce USA versus Salesforce Australia. Just curious. Do they do they sort of uh, match each other? Um, I, I can't, it sounds like they do. The, the same skill sets are in demand, but I was just curious if obviously the U.S. is a bigger market, but other than that, any differences? Yeah, I would say that that's the biggest difference is the U.S. is a much bigger market, so there are a lot more probably a lot more vacancies and a lot more candidates in terms of applicants. Um, you know, like I would, I guess I would say there's probably like two thousand to three thousand. Um, Salesforce, maybe a little bit more, um, 4,000 Salesforce job seekers across Australia or, or actual app, uh, candidates, not necessarily all of them looking for work at, at any one time. Otherwise, I'd be able to fill a lot more roles. Um, but but yeah, I would say so in terms of the, the volume of, of jobs and um, applicants or two applicants, it's probably quite similar. Um, the, 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 the demand is, is really, really high. And I think that's the same in the US from what, what I can see and what I hear. Um, on the second point around coming to Australia, like unfortunately, Australia makes it really difficult to come here. So um, you you do need um, visa sponsorship, which I, I know is probably very similar in in the US. Um, to get visa sponsorship, you have to uh, meet certain criteria, and that that is typically amount of time spent in the the role that you're doing or the the skill set you have. So um, you know, for, if, if I look at people that I've seen come to Australia with sponsorship, it's typically quite experienced people that you know might have been working with Salesforce for five years or. Um, three years plus a, a longer career with other technology, um, because you have to cert- meet certain criteria around that, and and um, and um, college um, education and and age, and and there's lots of factors. But you need a company to sponsor you, so um, you can't just come without a job. You have to get a job, um, and, and then obviously at the moment with Australia having really strict border closures, um, we haven't seen any new talent coming into the market for for probably 18 months now. So um, unfortunately, um, we, we're really short of um, of new people in the market. And historically, that wasn't a challenge because big corporate consulting firms were bringing in um, large volumes of, of people into the ecosystem every year, whereas now we're not getting that. So we're, we're, really, uh, we're really feeling that the pinch around um, uh, being able to, to find the right volume of candidates for opportunities. Thanks. All right. So Torin had a question, um, kind of backing up to our earlier discussion of, of developer uh, roles. Um, what, are, what are the competencies, the, the developer competencies you look for, and how do you identify those competencies? Uh, you know, is it coding questions and interviews? Do you look for a, a specific certs or a mixture? Um, so for me, I think it's, um, yeah, it's, it's really what, what someone has achieved. So what they've worked on, what they've delivered. Um, up until a point, obviously, I'm not technical at, at all. I, I, I can look at a piece of code and have absolutely no idea what it's trying to achieve. Um, so, so I'm not technical. I can't ask technical questions. But I'll be looking at like what you know, how long they've worked in in, in roles, what they've delivered in that role, 
what their exposure is to the more recent technologies. So, you know, are they a DevOps specialist or, or do they um, do they have, um, have they built a number of Lightning Web components? And if not, why was that? You know, is it just because of the environment they've worked in or um, is it not something that, that they're passionate about to learn? Um, and then I think when companies are interviewing, they're typically looking, you know, they are um, in most cases or some cases have someone technical. So they are asking technical questions and, and they're favoring um, people um, that have the, the technical skill set over just the certification in most cases, um, although some companies put certifications on, um, yeah, high up there on the list of things that people have to have. So I, I think it really does depend on the company. But um, I, I tend not to see people getting too many developer roles if they just have a cert but don't have the, the development skill set and development background. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, being able to, to code and, um, and understanding the, the, the governor limits and the limitations of Salesforce and, and all of those things, I think they're the things that will come up in an interview and, um, and, and that you would need to be able to kind of um, articulate and explain your experience around. That's helpful. Thank you. So I saw, um, Jeff, I saw your question. We'll go ahead and grab Alexander, who's been waiting, and then we'll tackle uh, Jeff yours and then over to Gerilyn. So Alexander, you All have right. the floor. Thank you. Hey, Ben. I just had a question about the job market and how it's gone remote. For a large extent of the at least the US and Australia it seems like as well it's pretty locked down has that impacted the job market of where um, candidates who are more open to that where they're working in an office now so that's an added benefit that Salesforce has or just in general yeah I think um, most people I speak to want at least some um, ability to work remotely into the future so um and, and some companies are still insisting on you know when things ease up here because we're actually still in lockdown at the moment so we've been in lockdown for in sydney for coming up to three months i think now so no one can work in an office um but but when when people can there are some companies out there that do want their staff back in the office um so it is a it's a fine line between how much is too much in terms of in the office and remote um but yeah i think as a candidate and a job seeker that you know, is looking to to gain traction in the market. If you can be flexible, that's probably the best way to be. Um, so rather than saying I only want remote roles or I only want office roles, if if you go into things with an open mind and and do um, offer a level of flexibility, because there will be some roles where you have to go into the office, and there will be some roles where they don't have an office and you have to work remotely. So I think that the the key is to to kind of being open and. Um, and obviously everyone's situation is different. Some people can't go to an office, but if you can, then, then make yourself available to do that because that will just open up the, the volume of opportunities to you. Awesome. Uh, Jeff asks, um, how important are college degrees in the interview process? Um, do you need a BA, for example, in marketing plus the relevant certifications um, to fill a Salesforce marketing position? Um, so I'm, I'm definitely not the best person to answer this because um, I think the US has a different take on on college degrees to, to um, the, the definitely Australia and, and the UK where I'm from. I didn't go to college, so um, I have my own view on that, I guess. But um, I, I think in the US, from what I understand, they, they tend to be more um, in demand and, uh, you know, I think they're, they're more um, valued perhaps than, than in, or not necessarily valued, but more um, expected than, than in some other countries. Um, I don't think you need uh, necessarily to have a, a, a college degree to be able to perform the role of a Salesforce professional. Um, I, does it hurt? Absolutely not. Um, you know, there, there's there's value in um, talking about your experience if it relates to the job that you want to do. Um, but but yeah, I, I don't necessarily think you have to have one, um, but there will be some hiring managers out there that, that think differently. That's a great point. I think in my experience, having sat on boards um, at, at Salesforce, uh, typically, the you know the hiring manager is more concerned with your technical proficiency and how and how you are in front of a customer as as opposed to if you have an MBA. You know, it's, it's can you do the job? How skilled are you? As opposed to you know what what your piece of paper from your uh, educational institution says. Um, so I, I would just throw that out there. Um, Geraldine, you are up. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for being here. Um, so if there are people in the group who maybe are transitioning military and haven't really gone through job interview processes before, could you explain what they might expect from a recruiter screening? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I guess it depends if uh, the recruiter is someone like me that um, is operating on behalf of different a range of different clients. And then um, if they're a recruiter that is employed by a company that's hiring for a professional. So I think if if the the company is 
uh, if you're applying for a role with Facebook and, and the person that you're speaking to is a recruiter from Facebook, it's going to be different than if you're um, speaking to a recruiter from Mason Frank that's recruiting on behalf of Facebook, if, if that makes sense. Um, so the, the, um, the, the person, if it's someone you're speaking like uh, with myself, then I'm, I'm obviously looking to make an assessment around you know, where your skills are, um, what your longer term career aspirations are, and the, the type of culture that you 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 want to to be involved in and the kind of business you want to work in because i am then looking at you know all of my different clients and trying to make a match there um whereas if you're speaking to someone that is employed by a company um they're probably going to target more like around that specific role so you know based on this job description what have you done what haven't you done why do you want to work at facebook um you know what what your strengths and weaknesses are in relation to the particular job so i think when you go into those kind of discussions you need to really make sure you are clear on what the role is uh, and what the expectations of the position are um and also um the, the the dreaded question why do you want to work here um you have to have a prepared answer for that and and it's um as a recruiter when i get feedback from a client and i've sent a candidate for an interview and they've been asked that question and uh, the worst thing you can say is because it pays well or um, because I need a job or um, because I'm I'm just not happy in my current role. Like, I think you have to really talk about what really excites you about that business. Um, and, and then there will be some curveball questions depending on um, the, the, the style of interviewer. So you just need to be prepared to be able to think on your feet. And remember, you can't prepare for everything, right? There, there's always going to be things that come up. So um, if if you um, if a, a question comes up that you don't know the answer to, just be honest and um, and explain how you would go about finding out the answer to that question. Um, in my experience, the worst thing you can do, apart from saying that you're only interested in the role because of the money, is um, is lie and and tr say you can do something that you can't because it's always going to come out through the process. And what what about? Um salary maybe it's different uh in the u.s versus australia but um what about the salary question that oftentimes um you'll get asked in a recruiter screening call so do, do they ask like your current salary or do they ask your expectations so i don't think they can ask anymore what do you currently make i think they have to ask what are your expectations Sure, that's good. Yeah, that that isn't a rule here, so you can still ask what you currently make. But I, I I tend not to because I think the value is you know the skill that you bring to the role and what the role is paying rather than how much of an increase you should be having on your your current salary. Um, so I, I mean I think it's really important to make an assessment on on where you fit in the market. Um, I, I I don't think that assessment is necessarily um, only done by speaking to friends, and I think that's that's something that a lot of people do. You know, they'll they'll speak to their friend, find out how much they're earning, and say that that's how much they want. But there's so much variation between um, different jobs in the market. You know, one developer at company A might do a completely different role to a developer at company B. So I think it's it's really important to make an assessment on your your value in the market by speaking to lots of different sources, and then. Um, do your research, look at, uh, look, look at salary surveys, but take them with a pinch of salt because, um, again, there's so much variation. And I don't think that you can, you can um, pigeonhole someone just based on how, much you, how many years experience they have, um, which is what a lot of salary surveys do. Um, but then I would come up with your number and I would confidently say, you know, this is the salary I'm looking for between this and this and give them a range because um, at least then there's a bit of negotiating. Um, so if, if you're looking for 100, I'd say I'm looking, I, I'm targeting roles between 100 and 110. Um, and uh, and yeah, and and obviously, see, ask them the question, put that back to them. How does that fit in with with your uh, your your business's expectations? Um, I think the worst thing is when companies then come back at the end of the process and offer you less than you you're looking for. Um, so I do think it's important to be clear with where your boundaries are because it's there's no point in wasting your time or or wasting their time. Um, so I'd have that discussion and, and give them a range and uh, and explain, you know, that's the, the the salary that you're positioning with all of the roles that you're discussing at the moment. And you're confident that you'll get um, an offer within that range. That's great advice, because I think a lot of especially transitioning military or military spouses who haven't um, worked in a while struggle to have that conversation. Um, and so I think that's, that's great advice to have that conversation up front. And I think a lot of recruiters are actually asking that question up front, um, hopefully so that they, uh, there's no, uh, disconnect about how much you are expecting to make and how much they can actually, uh, offer. 
Yeah, and also on that point, um, I I ask the question often, and people will say, especially if they've not looked for work in a while, um, they'll tell me I'm looking for market rate, and then I'll say, well, what's your understanding of the market rate? Because um, you know everyone has a different understanding of that, and your understanding could be completely different from the company's understanding. Um, but for me, if someone comes to me and says, you know, I have to earn a hundred a year, that's the minimum I can earn, then I know that I'll only approach them for roles that are paying a hundred or more. Um, so whereas if they just say, tell me market rate, then I could be bringing them roles that are paying way under what they're looking for. And it's kind of, you know, they're going to get frustrated that every time I call, I'm calling with a role for 70, but they're looking for 100. So I think just, um, yeah, setting boundaries is, is really important throughout the whole process. Um, that, that includes, you know, not just expectations on salaries, but expectations on how many days a week you're willing to work in the office and um, what hours you, you can work, um, how much flexibility you need. Like, I think as long as you're clear, then there's no kind of... Um, yeah, surprises through the process. Thank you. Just to piggyback on that, what was helpful for me, Geraldine, when I was going through my transition, because I had no concept of, of not only, you know, what, what does Salesforce professionals make, but what does anybody make in any industry? I, all I had lived was military. Um, so, you know, I did my market research and, and looked at Glassdoor and all the different sites, um, you know, Trailhead and whatnot. But what was helpful was that, um, you know, I came up with a range, but I also had a fallback plan where, you um, I had talked with one of my mentors and they had mentioned, you know, don't just think of it in terms of, of dollar amount for, for salary compensation is, is uh, you know, encompasses all these different things. If they're not willing to meet your dollar amount, um, but you can, you know, like, like uh, Ben was talking about, get, get you know, uh, remote work or flexible work uh, schedule, there's value in that too. So always, always have those little things in your back pocket. Um, and I've told this story before, but when I was negotiating my first role, it was between a couple different companies um, and they were, they were uh, the same with salary. And so I was trying to figure out which one I was going to go with. And I, I threw out, Hey, send me to Dreamforce uh, and pay for the whole trip. Cause I hadn't been. And you know, one of the companies accepted that and that's the one that I went with. So, um, you know, having those, those little things in your back pocket helps. Um, Jeff, I know you're next, but we've got a related question. So before we get off topic, um, we'll go ahead and tackle that. And then we'll circle back to you, Jeff. Anthony asks, speaking of salary, what, what is a typical price range for a first year, second year, third year, Salesforce admin role, and I guess it's probably going to be location dependent. But um, you know, if you have a, a ballpark, that, I guess that would be helpful. Um, I am going to throw this one and say um, that I'm going to ask this question, and I'll I'll um, I'll get um, I'll I'll reply to anyone that that has. I'll ask uh, Chris Hopper, or I recommend that you ask Chris Hopper, the um, the recruiter in the US, because I could give figures that are way wide of the mark. Um, like in in Australia, I would say um, like someone that that is coming into the market kind of quite new could earn like 70 to 80,000 um and then um you know when you get to the second third year you you're probably looking you know second year you're probably looking at 90 100 and then third year you you're over 100 but that's Australian dollars so it's really difficult for me to say and i think there's a lot of markets within markets as well right so you know, in, in Australia, um, Sydney, you'll probably earn a bit more than if you were in Brisbane. And in Melbourne, you're going to earn more than if you're in Adelaide. And I'm guessing in San Francisco, you're going to earn more than if you're somewhere else in, in the US, right? So um, it's a, a really hard question to answer. But that that is the kind of question that, that you need to be um, yeah, asking lots of different people. Because um, if you just trust one answer, you could be way wide of the mark. And also just do, do your research around the people you are asking, because I find um, a lot of recruiters don't necessarily specialize in Salesforce and they might have worked one Salesforce role in the past and then they have Salesforce written somewhere on their profile and then they give you um, guidance and, and it's completely wide of the mark. So um, I was on a call um, with a client last week and it was like an agency briefing. So there were, um, there were it was myself and two other recruiters from different companies and it was a Salesforce role and I immediately could tell the other two had no idea what they were talking about in the market. Because they were saying like the, you know, oh, it's going to be quite easy to find a technical architect. And I was like, it's just not going to be easy to find a technical architect. And then I come across as the bad guy because I'm the doom and gloom one. But I'm the only one that understands the, the, the reality of the market. So, so yeah, just pick and choose who you're, you're taking advice from as well. That's great tips. Thank you. Um, Jeff, you are up, sir. Yeah, I just want to jump back on what Ben said earlier about. Um, interviewing for developer roles. Um, it's not uncommon when you go to for a developer role position to have to complete some type of coding application. Like when I was at Aperio like eight or 10 years ago, we had all of our developers, once they got to the first stages of getting a recruiter, we already had a set up application that they had to develop. 
and show their competency in certain things, whatever it was was we're looking for. So don't be surprised if they ask you to develop an app or show your GitHub repos or something to that effect or what have you done. But uh, coding um, coding skills are going to be really important in, in that whole development process. Definitely. And uh, one thing I always advise is like, and this used to be more for face-to-face -face interviews, but take your laptop and offer to show someone a piece of your code there and then. Um, or now on Zoom uh, or, or Google, share your screen and say, look, this is something I've built in my own time. Because yes, a lot of companies do want you to do a technical challenge, but the reason they're doing that is to see that you can code and, and you understand how to approach different scenarios. Um, if you were to say in an hour interview, look, here's something I've built and let me talk you through it and why I did it this way and, and what I've achieved with it, you, you may um, skip that technical round because they might be comfortable with um, with with what you present. Um, and that's not just for for um, for developers. Like if you can build stuff in your own time, I know that there's a lot of content around this now, but um, you know, build stuff in your developer org, um, talk about it, shout about it, show it off, put it on your CV, um, because that gives people confidence that you can do what you say you are you can do. It's a fantastic point. And to that point, and I've talked about it before, and I'll keep talking about it because I think there's value in it. Um, the, the experience cloud sites. I just posted in, in chat a, a minute ago, there's a developer that had created one um, with, with code, but obviously, you know, uh, folks like me who, who um, don't code very well can also create them declaratively. And, and I've gotten a lot of great uh, feedback, but also, you know, professional development um, advances just because I, I took a week or so and I created that site and I share content on it and I promote it in you know, my email tagline, my LinkedIn taglines. I share it with folks during mentoring sessions. Um, so, you know, having a professional portfolio, whether it's it's programmatic or declarative, is a phenomenal way not only to get hired, but once you're already hired, to be able to refer back to that and and continue to boost your your professional uh, momentum and growth. Great point. All right, so we've got uh, got a couple hands raised, um, but before we get to Elio and then and then Andy, what I wanted to do was take a moment to get a quick uh, group picture. Um, so I need to rearrange my display here. Let's see. There we go. I swear I do work in technology. Um, so if you want to participate, totally optional, um, but go ahead and take the opportunity to um, unmute your video. And what I'll do is I'll share this uh, in social media tomorrow. You can feel free to reshare um, uh, as you see fit. So go ahead and get it going here. All right. And count of three for everybody. Three, two, and one. All right. We will turn what? into models for a few moments there. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Very good. So um, over back to you, Elio. You had a question or comment? Yeah, uh, just, a, just a quick comment uh, and, and, and piggybacking on what Ben has said with, with regards to, to pay. It's a process, right? I know some of you saw some of my comments on the chat. Um, you need to find your range and you can do that with different tools. Glassdoor is a great tool where you can get an idea of the type of roles, companies and region where you are in the country to get an idea of what, you know, what some of those roles are. There they have jobs with actual, and, and also LinkedIn, sometimes they will call out what is the, the range. So you should find a range you feel comfortable with. If if you if you're having difficulties, still reach out to your network and and find out, uh, because uh, this is something that I think will haunt you if you don't do your homework and you end up taking a job that is below you, what you think you should be making. It will haunt you. Trust me. <laughs> I did consulting, and uh, sometimes you know you're just excited to have a role in front of you. Um, it could be challenging once you've taken that role and uh, crawl out of that hole or whatever you want to call it. So I just wanted to make sure you you know that this is all part of it. The training, the networking, understanding what and take yourself out of it. Look at it from uh, your skill set, your military background, for those of you that are in the military. And, 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 and then look at the role and where you're applying for in, in part of the country to understand what is that range. It should be a process. It shouldn't be like, oh, I should be making a million dollars. <laughs> so I just thought I'd add that to the discussion. Yeah, those are, those are great points, Elio. Thank you. And, and if you're not monitoring chat, take a peek because folks are actually uh, chatting about 
uh, some of the trends, recent trends in, in salary pay bands, which is really helpful. So thank you for posting that information. I'm going to turn it over to Annie, who has a question. Another one. Um, when going through the interview process and listening to mentors and things like this where um, we're getting advice, you always hear you have to stand out. You have to make yourself stand out um, in the interview process. I found personally that can be kind of difficult because you're getting the same form questions that everybody else is getting. And so the way I stood out was I didn't ask those form questions back. And you can Google, you know, it, questions to ask during an interview. Well, 90% of those you can also find the answers to. So when I would do my research, I would find something very specific about the company, um, say a well being program. And I would ask the interviewer, how they felt about that going through COVID, if things had improved or, or if there was something that they would like to see. And I've stumped some interviewers. What's your key or thing that you would advise doing to help differentiate yourself from another candidate? Um, yeah, good question. I think uh, like it's it can be difficult in an actual interview to differentiate because um, a lot of the time you feel like you're on the back foot, right? Because you're being asked the question. So I think what you're saying around being asking different questions and you know find a, a particular point of interest around the interviewer as well so um you know if you look at their linkedin profile and, and you can see what their interests are you know try and find some commonality around that as well but i, I do think the biggest way to differentiate is is quite often before the interview and, and you know in the build-up they're going to do their research about you and and a lot of the time it's what you've created or or the brand that you have and they already have um, they've, they've done their research. They're reviewing that. There might be some uh, a link on your CV that takes you out to you know the Experience Cloud CV or some content you've created. Um, like the the although it's if, if you're on LinkedIn, you'll see that a lot of people are now creators. A lot more people in the world are consumers, right? There are so many more consumers than creators. And I think if you're a creator, then that's going to make you stand out. And uh, and that could just be a blog that you've written that you um you know you've you've um, you, you talk about, you discuss in the interview, it could be um, you know, a, a flow that you've built that solved a particular problem, or it could be something you use your Salesforce org as to run your day-to-day -day life um, around you know, the bills you have going out and you know, r reminders and, and all of these different things. I think that's, that's really what people are looking for as a differentiator point rather than particular questions, because um, ultimately they do want to know um, can you do this job? And and you, they want to have confidence that you have the Salesforce skills to be able to do that. Um, and I think that that's really how I see people differentiate themselves um, is by the content they create. Um, I'll give you an example. There's a um, there's a lady in Australia called Pooja, and she she was looking for her first Salesforce role, and uh, she was having the same challenges that everyone does um, in that companies weren't giving her a chance, and you know she she was finding it difficult to demonstrate her experience. So. We, we had a discussion and she um, she created a mini project which was around um, created a Salesforce org for, for um, a make-believe real estate company and how they track their um, their listings and how they engage with potential buyers and things like that she built that in a Salesforce org and she documented the whole journey um, and then she she posted about that on LinkedIn and tagged me in it and I, I liked it and one of my clients saw it and they approached her directly and hired her. Um, they invited her for an interview. She didn't have to apply for the role. Um, she got hired. She's been there for 18 months or so now. Um, I did a podcast with her um, a couple of weeks ago, ago, so that's a good uh, episode to listen to. Um, but she differentiated herself by being a creator and showing people what she could do with Salesforce. Um, and I think that's a lot, really probably the most powerful way that you can, can stand out in, in this crowd um, by being a creator and showing off your skills. Thanks. I'm going to post that um, link with Pooja in the chat if you're interested. But um, just before we head to the next question, um, Alexander, I see you have your hand raised. Just wanted to foot stomp that. I mean, Ben is 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 spot on. I mean, think about the thought leaders that you see in the industry, like David Giller, Nana Gregg, David Liu. They're all recognizable because they realized early on that content was king, and they and they create it. And anybody can do that. Really, anybody. Um, the more content you create and obviously the higher quality, the better you are able to stand out in the ecosystem and make a name for yourself. And I was able to do that and go from not, you know, from no one knowing me to essentially, you know, where I'm at now, which is where I wanted to be at Salesforce, just by posting content consistently and, and, and upgrading that quality over time and then you know, giving back and posting about that. So, um, yeah, if, if you're looking for a way to stand out, I think that's that's a phenomenal way to do it. And I, I've seen great success and I've seen other other of my mentees and other folks have great success with it as well. 
Um, it just takes practice. Just iterate and, and keep getting better. Any, anybody can do it. I'll just add to that as well. Like I'm, I'm here today because I create content. Like that's the reason I'm on this. This um, I've been invited to this. So I, I invited David onto my podcast because he creates content. That's how I, I came to know David. Um, I've mentioned Chris Hopper like five times. I, I've met Chris at Dreamforce, but he's he's someone I've become friends with through the ecosystem because he creates content, and I gravitated towards another recruiter that created content. Um, I, I really think that that is the the, the key way to to, to differentiate. And just remember, there's always someone further back than you. Um, like you, you've already taken the step into the ecosystem. There's someone today starting their Salesforce journey um, that, that's doing their first trailhead badge today. So, um, so don't forget, there's always someone that can learn from the stuff you've already done. So don't feel like you, that you can't create content because you're still relatively early in your journey because there's always someone that, that can learn from you. Just, just letting somebody in. Uh, I mean, those, those are all great points. And what I'm going to do is I'll post. Um, speaking of content, I'll just post for those that haven't seen it. My, my um, experience cloud site and chat. If you go to the shared content tab, you'll see uh, I've created a presentation that talks about how to create content. Because when I mentor folks, the biggest question usually is, I don't know what to say. I'm brand new to the ecosystem, or I just started. How, how can I create content? And the answer is, you absolutely can. Um, the presentation in there will tell you how to do it. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a crawl, walk, run methodology. You start with asking questions and you move forward as you gain experience to providing, you know, uh, resharing content and then developing your own content towards the other end of the spectrum. Uh, but you can get started at any point. Alexander, you are next on the questions, sir. All right. One more question. Dressing for the job you want, you know, I, I've interviewed developers in the past and, you know, I don't say it's a negative thing, but if they dress up in a suit and tie, I kind of dismiss them at first because I want to be more flexible, more creative mindset. Um, you know, what's your thoughts on it? Like right now I'm a delivery manager and while I'm doing a client facing like video call, I don't wear this, my Adidas shirt. I throw a collar shirt on for like 30 minutes, do the meeting, I throw it back off because I like more casual. But what's your thoughts on just the interview process for the job? I think um, one thing I've learned over the years, so I, I remember um, I used to have to wear a suit to work every day and Australia gets pretty hot and uh, I, I never really understood why I had to wear a suit to work, to, to sit at my desk um, all day pretty much and make phone calls. Um, so when I set up Talent Hub, I, uh, I decided I wouldn't wear suits anymore. So I've not worn a suit for, for a long time. But then I, I got a meeting with a client in a bank and I thought I can't not wear a suit to a bank. And uh, I went out and bought a suit, especially for this meeting. And I turned up and the guy wasn't wearing a suit. So, <laughs> so I felt uh, pr pretty stupid. So I think my, my best piece of advice is to be yourself. And, um, you know, I think, yeah, a developer in a T-shirt with uh, that looks, looks like they've had a, a long night coding probably looks like a good developer. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I think you, could, you, know, you, you are yourself. You're an individual. You, you should, um, I, I think, as long as you look professional, um, I don't think you necessarily have to wear, a, you know, you can wear a, 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 we call them polo shirts, but collared shirts, like, you know, what you'd wear to play golf. I, I think they look smart. Um, I, I think it's understanding um, expectations from from the people as well. Like you can ask that question if you're you're doing an interview, you know, I typically wear a t-shirt to work. Do I need to put a suit on for this one? And the, the HR or the recruiter will tell you if you should. Um, but for me, yeah, I think it, I've I've much um, I've preferred being myself and wearing clothes that I'm comfortable working in than being told I have to wear a suit every day. So um, I would just make sure you're comfortable and and you're 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 going into any interview in a a way that you feel confident and and comfortable to deliver your best performance. And whether that's wearing a suit because you think that's what they want and that's going to give you that level of confidence, or whether you you know you've got a, a killer T-shirt that gets you interviews and and always uh, always gets you the job, then then I, I'd make sure I'm wearing that. That's great advice. Dennis. I think uh, if you've done, uh, uh, sorry, David, I think if you've done the research on the company, you should have an idea of what their culture is. Um, I know my first job out of college when I went uh, with a suit and tie, uh, <laughs> I did get the job and the IT manager was telling me uh, after the fact in the luncheon, like two weeks later that, hey, you know what? You were the only one that came in with a suit and tie and uh, that got our attention that you cared about the role that you were applying for. And again, I knew the culture. I knew that, that it was a family owned and they were old school 
meaning that you know everybody wore either business casual and I, again i'm talking like 20 26 years later <laughs> so different time right so this, this comes back to do, do you, doing the homework and the research it's 2021 if you're not googling a company you're applying a job for and you don't know their culture then something's amiss so just be aware of that and, and it's not point. just about what you wear well make sure you have a pad like that's one thing i would always advise you have a pad and, and make notes and you know you can like obviously it's quite awkward on video yeah i mean I, hopefully everyone's got a pad next to them now but um but yeah just um just make sure that you're making notes and you can refer back to it and people share because because often if you're just sharing looking at the screen especially in this day and age it um like you're not it looks like you're not consuming the information and especially if you go for an interview face to face make sure you have um, a pad and make sure you have some questions planned like they're they're two things that people often don't do and um and, and yeah often that's a reason that they they don't because it looks like they haven't come prepared just to piggyback real quick on the question uh, or on the clothing issue before we, we move on to dennis then pearl i would say elia is absolutely right know the culture um but but i would also say know the subculture too so obviously in it you know we're, we're more laid back than say banking uh per ben's example so you can expect to see you know less less business suit wear however um with regard to the subculture like as an as a solution engineer you know most days i'm wearing my favorite salesforce t-shirt and if i really want to fancy it up because i have a customer I'll, I'll put on a polo with the salesforce logo on it um but when i started going to customer meetings because now COVID is you know has gotten to the point where they're starting to let us travel again um my account execs wear suits and so to that subculture point even though this, the solution engineer culture is very much casual the, the business, uh, the sales side of the house um, with the account execs is, is not as much. And so I needed to dress up for those um, for those appointments. So just be aware of that. Um, I would say have a have a range of outfits ready to go and then you're never surprised. All right. Dennis, you had a question or a comment. That, that was a suit and tie, David, you were saying the salespeople wear? Is that they? Yes. So um, recently it was a sport coat and button up and slacks. Um, and and they they've you know um, tossed the tie out, but um, but I had to bring like my last trip last week. I had to bring you know sport coat mm -hmm. and button up shirt and slacks, even though it was South Carolina and it was like ninety. <laughs> no tie, no tie. Yeah, no tie. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I think we they reserve the tie for those um, you know maybe the, the upper echelon, the the um, the uh, executive leadership te team type meetings. This was more. Uh, the business functionals and so we were just in sport coats actually that wasn't my question but uh <laughs> it was just yep. interesting um yeah i've got a specific salary negotiation i'm in a salary negotiation with a company right now and i want i was hoping to get uh a some tips on on a negotiating tactic from anybody on the group ben or david or anybody um so if you'll indulge me for 30 seconds here let me explain where i'm at i got a i had a conversation with the talent acquisition lady um, after the whole process. Um, and I got an offer in, via email. Um, so, I, so I called her really hard to get a hold of to ask some clarifying questions. And, F, and just background information, the hiring manager is out of the picture. They said, no, we don't deal with this. You just talk to talent acquisitions. Long story short, um, I went back via email and voicemail to the talent acquisition person. I said, thank you for the information during our phone call yesterday. The BA role and benefits look fantastic. And given the significant contributions I, ex I expect to make to your company, as well as the company's reputation for paying competitively, I would like to extend this counter offer. And I put X plus 10,000, right? So they gave me X, X number. I gave them X plus Y, 10,000 more thinking. They come back with, 5,000 less, I'm golden. Any rate, that was a week ago. So nothing heard back. Um, and I'm wondering what my next move is. So this is kind of a tactical situation. If anybody has any um, suggestions on what my next move would be. And by the way, I am willing to take the original offer, just FYI, but I did I did want to at least ask for more. And uh, so this, that's where I'm at. What did you explain for wanting more? Did you look at it from a third person of, Hey, it is my understanding that a person or an individual with this much experience, with this much background, the range is X to, to X. Oh yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned I did the. I went to Glassdoor and four other sites and asked around and got a range, 
and um and, and their offer was below the range and so i'm trying to get into the range with my counter offer and that's that's kind of where we're at yeah, I think that's it's good that you've explained that. Like, I think that's really important to give the the clarity and um, and context around you know why because because sometimes people just think you are you know you're being um, unreasonable, which is crazy, right? Because you're just looking for the salary you're looking for. But but when it's um, when you're negotiating an offer, um, people sometimes yeah get get a bit funny about it where they shouldn't. It's really unfortunate that you don't have the the touch point with the hiring manager because. Um, uh, often talent acquisition people are the, the you know they're the in between so they're not the one making that decision they have to go and get approval um like are you interviewing with other roles at the moment is there anything else on the table that you you're considering uh nothing nothing as far along as this no but like you have applications in uh yes but nothing really is that, I, I, I mean, I think you need to give them some sort of because the, there's been a delay it's like the the fear of loss right I think you need to paint the picture that you are at the moment holding off on some other applications and um and you know you're you've been waiting to hear back from them but it's been a week and and ultimately you need to to move forward with your job search one way or another um so so i would say that you know at, at this stage you've held off because you are really keen on joining the business um and uh, and keen on having a discussion around how you can um both find a a, a package that works for everyone um, and you'd really welcome an opportunity to discuss that on the telephone because um, as it stands you're holding off on some other people that have contacted you about opportunities um, and, and ultimately you don't want to miss out on an opportunity although you are keen on their opportunity because um, yeah really this needs to be done on the telephone because um, the email negotiation is uh, it yeah, it's not the the ideal way, and I know you've tried, and and they're they're being challenging. But I think give them give them a, a little bit of a, a boot up the backside in that you know you're not just going to sit around and wait for them to come back forever. Um, but you are keen, and and you do want to to kind of have a discussion around how you can make it work for everyone. And um, yeah, it's it's really poor from them that it's been a week and they've not come back to you. In in all honesty, like that that isn't the right way to kind of go about it from a talent acquisition perspective. Yeah, they don't seem. Uh... They have, I guess, they have a reputation for being slow and very not very communicative. So um, I think I will have to uh, send another email and voicemail, and um, maybe mention the salary research, emphasize that aspect a little bit more. And uh, like you said, I'm keen on working for their company, and um, hope to hear back soon, kind of thing. We'll see. I hope I didn't lose it. We'll see. Yeah, keep us posted. I'm interested to see with Ben's advice what they what they come back with. Dennis, right. this is Annie. I was waiting on a reply back from a company, and I was like you. I found an article on LinkedIn about how um, companies who are hiring for Salesforce have five days from the time they get the application to hire the person or they're gone. I posted it. Two hours later, I got a call. Uh, I'm not following. You posted the article where? on LinkedIn, I shared it on LinkedIn. It talked about how the Salesforce ecosystem right now, the need for people is so high that when a company receives their, uh, receives the, um, the application, they have an average of five days to hire that person or they're gone out of the system right. because yeah, somebody else has already right. hired them. The candidate is gone, you're saying. Right, yeah. Dennis, uh, you know, um, the and this is why we recommend uh not to put all your eggs in one basket even though if it's your ideal company uh there's a reason why sure. things happen right I, I went through a job i was i was actually ahead of in a job process with the state of texas the state attorney's office great role uh eight and a half years ago well they missed the boat they delayed the the offer letter and i just finished and received my offer letter from salesforce you know, <laughs> and, and so you just sometimes you just got to look at these things and say, OK, you know, uh, we, we should try to fish with a net, not not with a pole. Right. Because we live in an oh, environment course. where there's a lot of high demand. You just heard Annie's great point there. People are getting pulled up and sometimes we think, oh, no, maybe if I only apply to this company, I'm going to get a job there. You, 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 there's there's a reason why things happen i'm not saying that you know these po folks are not going to call you back but uh i i would i, I mean, would i had i had an in with this company and yeah uh, so i had a uh an internal or kind of like an internal referral so 
Um, any rate, yeah, uh, definitely good to have more than one iron in the fire. No doubt about that. Yeah. So we are at time. Um, I know we've got a couple more questions. Ben, do you have a hard stop or can you extend a couple minutes? No, I'm good. Good to go. Um, Angela asks, uh, any advice on how to prepare for technical interviews? Uh, speak, uh, so you know, if I can, if I can uh, chime in real quick, my recommendation would be because technical interviews are going to differ based upon the company and the role, you really need to find folks that work in that role at that company and ask them for help. Um, case in point, I've, I've mentored probably the last three or four um, solution engineers that we've hired to my team at Salesforce. Um, they've re reached out to me on LinkedIn and I've walked them through the process, you know, listened to their dry runs and, and talked to them about best practices because I had an intimate knowledge of that role having interviewed for it. Whereas if you, if you go cross company or cross role, it's going to differ. So you may not get as good of a, of a mentorship opportunity. I don't know, do, Ben, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think that's that's great advice. And if you can't reach out to them directly, like look at their LinkedIn profiles, look at to see what they're working on in their current role, because, you know, if they're working on um, a particular product, then there's a good chance that you'll be asked questions around that product as well. Um, and uh, and yeah, just just really focus on like what what's on the job description. What what do you think what could come up? And then um, and then also being confident around like if you haven't worked with um if you haven't done integration in a while, but that's something that's on your CV, brush up on it because if it's on your CV, you should be uh, confident that you can answer questions on on anything that's on there. I would just close it out to say, take advantage of the military trailblazer network. So that the first thing that I do when I'm looking for roles is I look to see what military trailblazers work at that company in that role because I know that you know um, we love to help each other, and so the, the, they're more than likely going to be able to. Uh, willing to spend some time with you to discuss that technical interview process. So that's the first thing that I do. Um, but that is, I think that's all the questions we had and, and we're a little bit over time. So thanks very much, Ben, for spending the extra time to answer. Um, and before we close, I, I just want to thank Ben once again for spending time to talk in general about the you know, hiring practices, uh, trends, um, you know, tips. It was a really informative session and I think everyone got a lot out of it. Um, I, I definitely learned a lot. So thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Well, hopefully we will see you all next Wednesday. Have a great rest of your night and have a great rest of your week and uh, take care. See ya.